I'm going to start with just a brief history, a very brief one, of um, what happened before we all started this. <laughs> um, the, in 2001, Yale University had its 300th anniversary, and you can actually look at that as kind of a key moment in the recent histories of um, colleges looking at their past. Um, Yale's 300th anniversary actually uh, was, during its 300th anniversary, like most uh, universities at major anniversary moments, the university commissioned its own history, an official history. And that history paid a lot of attention to Yale's contributions and the contributions of Yale alumni to, the slave, to um, anti-slavery and abolition. And one of the consequences of that was a group of graduate students um, and faculty um, actually responded with a history of Yale's relationship to slavery and the slave trade, um, which was in fact a much deeper, longer, richer history and less contested than Yale's contributions to anti-slavery, which included in fact actually lots of, ab lots of abolitionists who were Yale alumni, but who were effectively actually excommunicated by the university over their politics. Um, it cr created quite a scandal around the 300th anniversary with lots of accusations going back and forth. And then within a couple of years, the trustees at Brown University elected Ruth Simmons, um, an African-American woman, as their next president. Um, and the, being the first person of color and the first woman to head an Ivy League institution, um, one of the things that resulted, that resulted in was a kind of um, the public secret of Brown's relationship to the slave trade um, became in fact even more public. And uh, President Simmons commissioned a study, um, the Com Committee on Slavery and Justice, to look at um, Brown's relationship to the slave trade and slavery, to bring forth that history and to make recommendations about how the institution might actually repair that past. That was published in 2006. It's available online. It's digitized, along with all of the um, documents that support the research. Um, and, but one of the things that was interesting for me is that I was actually about four years into my project when that happened. I was in England um, doing research for the book, and I just assumed I was out of business. I assumed that all of the other Ivy League institutions would commission studies and bring forth reports. Um, and when I got back, what I realized is none of them did. Um, in fact, something else happened, um, which I think I'm quite proud of. That there was a kind of grassroots movement on a lot of campuses of faculty who began teaching courses on um, Princeton and slavery, Columbia and slavery, Williams College has one. Um, uh, archivist and librarian started doing exhibits that showed, in fact, that documented the relationship between various colleges and um, slavery. Um, and that movement, along with student activism, has pushed, in fact, this story forward. And I think, for me, in the past few years, there are four projects that have been transformative in this sort of political and intellectual moment in the history of universities. Um, the Columbia Project, Georgetown, Harvard, and Princeton. Um, and so two of those are represented here, but we'll also have a chance to talk about the others. I wanted to start with just sort of asking you about the major findings from your study, so we can jump right into that history, and then we can go back and forth with, with you know, how it compares to other institutions. Monica, can I start with you? Sure. I, I would say that in a nutshell, what we discovered is that the history of Princeton is the history of America writ small. We are a place where liberty and slavery were intertwined from the very start. Princeton was founded in 1746, and we now understand that it was money derived from slave labor that paid for the property upon which we sit. We know that money derived from slave labor funded the construction of Nassau Hall, the, the central building on our campus. We now know that the vast majority of our founding trustees were slaveholders, that our first nine presidents were slaveholders, that many of our early faculty members, including a faculty member as late as 1840, we're slaveholders. But that doesn't make us special. It makes us very like Harvard, very like Yale, and it makes us very American. I would say the one thing that really distinguishes us from other schools is the makeup of our student body. In an era when Yale and Harvard had approximately 9 to 10 percent of their students coming from the South, we had on the average 40 percent of our students coming from the South. In some years, in 1851, for example, just as tensions were really building up towards the Civil War, nearly two-thirds of our students came from the South. 
We were the most national school in America, save perhaps the military academy at, Fort, at West Point, but we were deeply Southern. Now there's several consequences of this. One is that what happened at Princeton mattered because young men were coming from across the country to our campus in New Jersey, learning something and taking those ideas back home. But more importantly, I think for our story, uh, are the ways in which that very Southern orientation of our student body co contributed to two things. One, the extraordinary acts of violence that took place on our campus and in our town in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. We had a very large number of young men from slaveholding families in the South who had come north to Princeton, and they're not only encountering roommates who might have different ideas, they're encountering a free black community for the first time in their lives, and it didn't always go well. The second consequence of that very Southern orientation of our student body is that the university evolved what I would call a very conservative character, which we might say it still has. When about half of your students come from the South, you depend on their tuition money. You, you need to keep their parents happy. You need to persuade their parents that their young boys aren't going to be corrupted by coming as far north as New Jersey, where of course slaveholding actually did not end until after the Civil War. Princeton became known as a place that was friendly towards Southerners. And um, I think that had very deep consequences on our campus. Uh, we feared, on our campus, we feared abolitionism more than we feared slavery. And was the most surprising finding for you the extent of that violence? I think the most uh, surprise, surprising thing for me was really understanding how Southern we were. We actually went into the archives, compiled a, an Excel spreadsheet of all 7,000 students who attended our school before 1865, and students figured out where they were from. Okay. And analyzing that data has been incredibly um, fruitful for us. Okay. And Professor Foner? Uh, well, uh, Columbia, where I teach, or which started out as King's College before the American Revolution, is uh, very, very different from Princeton in numerous ways. Um, Columbia had almost no Southern students, really less than a dozen in the whole 50, 60 years before the Civil War, uh, partly because there were no housing for them, there was no place for students to get meals in the, universe, in the college buildings. Uh, and um, also it was mostly connected with the Episcopal Church and there were a number of Episcopalian colleges in the South if you wanted to send someone for that kind of education. But what Columbia and Princeton have in common is this deep connection with slavery uh, from the very beginning. I could just repeat some of the things that Marnie said. Just about all the early presidents, with one exception, were slave owners. Most of the early governors that, or trustees uh, were slave owners or, at le or merchants who made their fortunes uh, either in the African slave trade, they were, they were trustees who actually were involved in bringing slaves from Africa to uh, either the Caribbean or New York, uh, but many more in the West India trade in dealing in the products of slave labor, particularly sugar, of course, uh, at that time. So the money that founded the King's College came partly from the state of New York or the colony of New York, uh, and, but in large measure from these trustees who, who's, you know, whose money came from slavery in one form or another. Now we and Marnie, I guess, both had the great advantage when we started that Craig Wilder had published his wonderful book, Ebony and Ivy, uh, which deals with a lot of colleges, but you know, the research he had already done on these institutions was a great starting point uh, uh, for us. Unlike Princeton, Columbia moved twice. Uh, in the um, 1850s, they moved from lower Manhattan to what is, became Rockefeller Center, and then around 1900, they moved from there up to Morning Sun Heights, where we are now. Uh, the result of that was that a lot of the records and documents of the college got lost or thrown away, or I don't know what happened to them, but our the documentary record of Columbia is much thinner than appears to be the case at Princeton, unfortunately. But what we tried to track down was all the ways that slavery intersects with the lives of, for example, students. There's no evidence of, of students uh, 
actually having slaves on, well, even to say campus, it was one building, it was, you know, um, except for one, George Washington's stepson who came before the Civil War, uh, uh, before the Revolution, I should say, and brought a slave along with him. But all of these kids, students, came from families that owned slaves, so they knew about slavery. There were domestic slaves in their homes when they, they didn't live in the college building, they lived at home, so there was slavery in their lives all the time. Um, but then there, we also try to look at the relationship of Columbia to anti-slavery movements. The New York Manumission Society in the post-revolutionary years was pretty uh, actively, uh, many Colombians, John Jay, Hamilton, others were involved in that. But as with Princeton, very little abolitionism came out of Columbia. The, if those who began to criticize slavery in the 1820s, the 1830s, were colonizationists, very moderate anti-slavery who believed that the free black population and the slave population eventually should be removed from the country and sent to Africa or somewhere else. That was sort of the respectable form of anti-slavery. The president of Columbia, William Dewar, in the 1830s was also the president of the New York Colonization Society at the same time. Only one active, real abolitionist came, that we found came out of Columbia, John Jay III, no, John Jay II, the grandson of the founding father, John Jay, he became a very active abolitionist, uh, and all through he was the major lawyer defending fugitive slaves who were captured in New York and uh, things like that. So um, the point is both these institutions and all the other ones, as Craig pointed out in his book, are embedded in the society that they exist in. Obviously, they're important institutions, they reflect the good and bad of their larger society, but they certainly did not take any action to challenge the existing structures of society. And one of the things I was interested in is the, um, these individual institutional studies from Brown through Columbia, Harvard, uh, Princeton, Georgetown, um, have begun to actually turn the way we think about this history. This is no longer a grassroots movement of you know, scholars and librarians presenting something that universities don't want to hear. Right. And I think Columbia, Princeton, and Harvard have been critical to this in the last few years. We've now reached a turning point yeah. where the institutions are taking responsibility for their own histories. L let me just add to what you said a minute ago, Craig. I mean, it's true, taking the Yale case, uh, that a lot of this bubbled up from the bottom up, so to speak. At Columbia, it just shows you how serendipity, it was actually the president of the university, right. Lee Bollinger, uh, who um, bumped into me on campus one day and had read Craig's book and said, are we doing anything about this? <laughs> I said, well, I, I, no, and I said, well, no, I've been thinking about doing something, but I never got around, you know. He said, well, why don't we do something? And we sat down and mapped out how we would launch a project to build on what Craig did. So, you know, and I have to pay tribute. The administration did give money, which is important, to help fund student research and creating a website and all that kind of thing, and really was willing to let the chips fall wherever they may. There was no sense of embarrassment. There was no, oh wait, we don't want to get this dirty linen out in public. I think uh, President Bull correctly took the stance, if we're out front on this, nobody can claim we're hiding our history. Let's put it out there in all its warts and all, you know, and this is the history of the university, and we all ought to know what it is. Well, and your project began in much less grand form. That was you with yeah. some students right. yeah, and our, with no funding. Exactly. Ours was definitely a bottom-up um, project. Yeah. Um, our, our project started about five years ago. I had recently moved to Princeton. I was ignorant. I was curious. I was very aware of the studies that were going on in other places. And I just decided to get into the archives for a semester with some undergraduates and see what we could find. And it was, it was challenging. I didn't really know how to frame the questions. I don't think I understood what undergraduates could figure out themselves with the uh, resources we had available. But gradually, we began to find a story. Um, but I will say our project was, how can I say this, never um, Mm. <laughs> em embraced? Be, be no, I think in the, end, in the end, we were definitely embraced by the administration, okay. but the administration did not directly support us with funding. In retrospect, I actually see it as an advantage. Our, our project grew to be quite, quite broad. If 
If you all haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to go to our website, slavery.princeton.edu. It now includes the equivalent of more than 800 printed pages of research stories by undergraduates, graduate students, and professional colleagues, about 370 primary source documents, interactive maps, videos, et cetera. Um, but our project also eventually grew to include the Princeton University Art Museum, the, our wonderful town public library, the public schools in our town, and our local off-Broadway theater. And I think that had we been more controlled by the central administration, we might not have had that freedom to branch out and bring the arts in and bring the town in to the project in quite the way we did. Yeah. And in fact, I think your story is most typical, right? That most of these university studies have actually been the university administrations catching up with what the faculty and the um, staff are doing. Well, that's what um, happened at, at Harvard. Yeah, that's right? definitely what happened mm -hmm. at Harvard. Um, mm -hmm. And MIT just launched an MIT and slavery project we're teaching for the first time this semester. And so we, and it, I think it helps to show how um, ubiquitous slavery is in the history of the histories of these institutions. MIT is founded in Boston in 1861 on the eve of the Civil War. Um, and so within MIT's official histories, there was always the assumption that the institution had no connection to slavery at all. Um, it was founded in sort of at least self-described abolitionist Boston. Um, but what we forgot was that in fact our founder was from Virginia. Um, our chief archivist, has just, who team teaches the course with me, has just discovered that he owned six people, um, he and his wife, um, in Charlottesville just before they left to build the dream of MIT um, in Massachusetts, that the money for the institution largely came from cotton textile manufacturers um, who need engineers to actually, who needed engineers to build machines and keep them running, um, and that in fact the institution had a sort of cold relationship to abolition, um, our founder also did, um, and in fact that we had a heavy Southern presence um, mm -hmm. in our student body in the first several, uh, the first few decades of um, MIT's history. Um, and so one of the things I want to sort of um, ask about is what happens now with the histories of these institutions that have, are now being embraced by the administrations, embraced, embraced institutionally, and their you know, fantastic websites that actually deliver to the public and make available to the public, not just the research, but the basis of the research. What happens to that history now on campus, and how does it come to, how is it starting to reshape the institutions themselves? Well, I, uh, two things I'd say to that. One, in our particular case, our, our website and our project just went public two weeks ago. So it's, it's information that's still new to everybody. So we don't really have the what's next yet. But I think that your question gets at the heart of one of the critical distinctions between projects that are mandated by the administration, as was the case at Brown, and projects that are bottom up. In the case of the Brown project in, in the mid-2000s, it was part of the mandate of the people who did the research on the history to make recommendations about how to move forward. For the bottom-up projects, that's completely not in our mandate, and it's really not appropriate for a faculty member to take that as their mandate in, in the structure of how universities work. Right. So in our case, and I, I mm -hmm. can't speak to how it will work at Columbia, I, I, re I can't say what's going to happen. It's, it's uh, the next phase of the project is going to move outside of this history project that I've run with, with so many wonderful colleagues and students over the past few years. And it's going to become a conversation that involves students, administrators, alumni. And it's not going to be me that's in charge of that project. Well, the other thing that your project has done though is it, it's spilled over into the town of Princeton. Yeah so that the um, surrounding communities of Princeton, all of those constituencies beyond the gates, um, are actually actively invested in now what the conversation that's happening on campus. Is there... Yeah, one of the things I'm very proud of, we approached the public schools maybe two years ago, and I just took them some of the great documents that we had found from the town of Princeton. Acts of violence, documentation of a slave sale that took place on our campus in 1766. Um, some writings by outside travelers who traveled through the African-American community t in town in the early 19th century. And they've created uh, curriculum units that they're now teaching at our local public high school in um, AP US history. Because students in our high schools had no idea that there were slaves in their town. They had no idea. And I don't think that can be the case moving forward. So I think that's a very positive development. Yeah, I, mean, I think we, at Columbia, we haven't really figured out either what 
to do with this information. And the Columbia project is going forward because uh, there are other faculty, Carl Jacoby, uh, Stephanie McCurry, and others who are very invested in it. So it's not just one faculty member and students. Um, one of the things that is happening is um, is moving forward in time. It started out as Colombian slavery, and the first iteration went up through the Civil War. But now it's going into the later 19th century, into the early 20th century, and it's broadening beyond slavery to include, you might know, just say, race in many. Uh, what was being taught, what was being taught at the medical school about racial science, you know? What was being taught in history and economics about slavery and things like that? Um, and uh, what about students? When were black students actually allowed into Columbia? It's not so easy to figure that out, actually, because many of the listings don't tell you what the race of the person is, but it was pretty late. Um, not as late as Princeton, yep. but pretty late. <laughs> uh, but um, but I, I do want to emphasize, and this is certainly true in Marnie's project too, the real, you know, even though, as I said, yes, we were very grateful to get funding from the administration, but the real impetus came from students and student research and seminar that I taught a number of times and then Carl taught about slavery, which, where students did research papers. And at the beginning, as you said, we didn't even know what the questions were, much less the answers. Students kind of figured out, well, let's go and find if there's any notes that students took in class in 1810 or 1820 and see what they're being taught about slavery and world history and things like that. There are such things. Or let's go and look at the student debating societies, which have records going way back. And they had debates, you know, resolved the abolition of slavery would be a good thing or a bad thing and what happened in those debates. So. Um, there's also, and then fundraising projects. So in other words, there's all sorts of ways you can get into this if you put your mind, if, if you imagine, you know, and I, and I have to pay tribute to the students who really got invested in this and because they were coming up with new information, completely new information about their own institution. Um, and, um, you know, that'll continue. This seminar is going to be taught every single academic year. I've retired, as we said, but there are plenty of other people who are going to be moving it forward. And what happens, I don't even know. People are going to have to start talking about that. What do we do with all this in terms of the institution itself? And one thing I want to add here is, you know, people, many people have asked me why we focused on creating a website instead of a book. It's because we keep finding things. And honestly, yeah. just last month, we, we've made an a, incredible discovery. The story was that our first African-American students came as part of a military program at the end of World War II. So we didn't have African-American undergraduates on our campus until the late 1940s, which is shameful. But just last month, we discovered that African-American students at the Princeton Theological Seminary, which is a separate school only about a mile away, in the 1890s began taking classes on our campus. And the rule at the time was that if you took a class, a single class, you could apply to get a master's degree. And we just last month identified five or six men who received master's degrees from Princeton University in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. One of them was an older student who had been born into slavery. And that was a shocking discovery for us. And quite certainly, he will be the only Princeton graduate ever to have made that long journey from yeah. slavery to freedom. It's actually interesting that somehow graduate level education was never as restrictive yeah. as undergraduate. Whenever the first, I think the first African American, American born African American student in Columbia College was around 1905 or six or seven or something like that. But uh, there were, MA students before that, and in fact, in the whole, then in the rest, up to 1950, there were very few undergraduates, but Columbia produced a whole bevy of PhD, black PhDs, right. Teachers right. College kept turning out black teachers, the sociology department, uh, the journalism school, there's somehow the restrictions on entry at the graduate level, for one reason or another, seemed to be much more porous than, at the, than for the college itself. One of the amazing documents we found working on this was a letter from a New York merchant, an abolitionist in 1835, written to the president of Princeton, who said that if Princeton would admit students regardless of color, he would donate $1,000. $1,000 was a significant percentage of our annual budget, and we were actually broke at that time. But we turned him down, because that, that, was, that was not the Princeton way. And that's, in fact, the same moment where Yale University, also on the verge of bankruptcy, 
um, rather than actually turning to abolitionists inside New England, um, turned to its Southern alumni um, and began a massive fundraising campaign in the South um, through the Colonization Society, actually, to rescue it out of bankruptcy. And so mm -hmm. it, it again turned to its southern roots like a lot of institutions did. And do you see this history actually changing the way that the universities themselves present their past? I'm sorry, did you see? The, the, what, you, what you found changes the way that the university officially presents its past. Not quite yet, I don't <laughs> think. I'm not sure in their brochure that they're sending out to prospective <laughs> undergraduates. Uh, it, it, you know, we, can, we can scribble that in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there is a there is a danger. I don't. You know, there is a danger of it sort of just being co-opted into a university kind of self-congratulation and say, "Well, look, we we look how much free speech there is here. Look how we don't put any limits on scholarship. We're leading." I'm 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 not against it. I think it would, the, the alternative would be much worse. But you know, to, as as part of a kind of feel-good thing. Well. Yeah, there's this bad history, but at least now we are talking about it, and that shows how great we are. So that's not sufficient. But I have, no, I haven't seen yet, because it's still going on, any significant impact on how the university dis displays itself to the public, you know, that we have now done this research. By the way, there's also a Columbia and Slavery website you can look at, along with Marnie's, which has and a an lot of stuff And an MIT and Slavery website there. you can look at, and along yeah. with Marnie's and Aaron's. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. And um, I wanted to add in, you know, when I said before, I think Columbia, um, Princeton, and Harvard were a turning point in all of this where it, there's no going back from the story of universities and slavery after mm -hmm. these reports have come out. There was, in fact, actually up until probably 2013, 2014, a lot of um, concern about those, among those of us who were working on these projects that we could really just um, lose this mm -hmm. past again. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we're going back, but I think one of the turning points in that is Georgetown. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, I think what happened at Georgetown matters a lot, and I'll just describe it very quickly. The story of Georgetown has actually been well known for a long time, except no one paid attention to it. Um, Jesuits have been writing about the Jesuit slave holdings in Maryland since at least the 1970s. Um, and Jesuit priests had done their dissertations on those Jesuit slave holdings. Um, and the story is a, a relatively um, simple one to tell. Uh, the Catholic Church in British North America um, funded itself and largely protected itself from anti-Catholic campaigns by investing heavily in land and slaves. Um, the plantations in Maryland, there are five major Catholic uh, church-owned, Jesuit-owned plantations in Maryland, um, funded all of the church's sort of um, missions uh, for about 200 years, um, beginning in the 1630s and continuing through um, 1838. Um, that included the funding of Georgetown when it's established um, in, officially in 1789. It's actually established before then. Um, and uh, Georgetown, therefore, depends heavily upon two things, both slave labor and the money coming out of the plantations. The Jesuits finally actually, uh, in Maryland, dissociate from slaveholding in 1838, um, not by emancipating their slaves, but by selling them in two parcels into Louisiana. So they sell 272 people. Um, the money from that sale, um, around some, well over $100,000, somewhere around $117,000, um, about, I think, a quarter of it is used to pay down the debts of Georgetown. Um, but some of it is also used to expand the Catholic Church um, and to institutionalize the church. Um, and so the first um, Catholic university college in New England, Holy Cross, the first Catholic college in New York, Fordham, are all in fact a product um, of that 1838 sale. Hmm. Um, and the reason why this matters for this conversation, I think, is that Georgetown is unique among the institutions that actually have these, this, this history. It's the only university established before 1800 that actually still maintains its religious identification. Right? Um, and it's precisely because of that religious identification that Georgetown wasn't able to do something that a lot of universities did as they confronted this past or were forced to confront this past. They weren't able to treat it as simply an academic issue, as simply an intellectual problem to be researched and published and treated as a kind of um, an academic enterprise. They had to deal with the moral consequences of publishing that past acknowledging it and making it known. Um, and I want to sort of turn to that question with both of you, because I know you've both wrestled with it in different ways. 
Um, how has that issue of the sort of moral consequences of the history that you're um, researching and making known affected both you and your students? Sorry. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean. That was a good question. I, you know, I, in, in the case of Princeton, um, it is true to say that the institution itself never owned people, right. but our presidents did, and enslaved people lived on our campus, and our students lived in what I call a landscape of slavery. They could look out of Nassau Hall, where they lived, ate, prayed, studied, see slaves at the president's house, see enslaved people on the main street in front of town, see enslaved people at the farm behind them, and open their door and let enslaved people deliver their firewood. So the fact that the institution didn't own them doesn't mean it wasn't omnipresent in people's lives. I think for me and, and for my students, it's just a very powerful kind of knowledge. To, to know this, honestly, in a way, is kind of liberating. To, to know this is to be able to move forward. To, to know this is to be able to grapple with the complexity of the American past. Um, I think that universities who are afraid of these sorts of studies are making a critical mistake. It's not, it's not embarrassing to Princeton that this happened. This happened, this is history, this is, you have to own it. What would be embarrassing is for us to just hide it under the rug and not look. So I've, I've taught this class with freshmen in it and I think for them to arrive on our campus and just see this as the DNA of their campus, there, there's no going back from that. This is who we are and, and they embrace that. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Marnie just said. I think among the students in the seminars that I taught and others, uh, they were really moved by what they found. I mean, they all said this is like the highlight of my career, my, my undergraduate career, for, and trying to, uh, they wanted to go tell everybody, on, everybody on campus has to know this. They, they were kind of figuring out, well, why can't there be a required course for every undergraduate on Columbia? I said, that might be difficult to staff, you know? I mean, that, that would require hundreds of people to be in a small, but, um, you know, or maybe the freshmen coming in in orientation, there ought to be a presentation to them. I mean, they were trying to figure out ways to get this information to people, uh, especially at the university itself, which meant it really made a very deep impact on them. Um, I, I find it hard to, I, it's hard for me to say what the impact on me was actually, Craig. It, you know, historians aren't very introspective, at least I'm not. Um, and uh, that's what very few historians write autobiographies. I mean, people in English departments, anthropologists, that's all they do nowadays is write about themselves. <laughs> because if they, if they write about anyone else, they're kind of exploiting them. So uh, <laughs> you can only write about yourself. But there aren't that, you know, and most of the autobiographies of historians are awfully boring, frankly, mm -hmm. but... Um, yeah, we don't do anything. So, you know, I, I suppose I have treated it like as an academic project, you know, that this, we, are, we are creating knowledge, which is what our job really is, and we are learning about our institution, we're learning about our city, we're learning about our society, and the point of knowledge is to put it out there so that everybody can use it in whatever way they want. And there's no way you can control. Anyone who's ever written a book knows you cannot control what people take from your book or what conclusion they may draw from your book, which may be quite different from what you intended. Um, so it's still a work in progress, I think, as to exactly what the long-term impact on these institutions is going to be of these this kind of revelations. And I wanted to uh, take that a little bit further. I think one of the things that happened at Georgetown, which was remarkable, was um, precisely because of Georgetown's continued religious identity, the president of Georgetown, Jack DeJoya, had to or had addressed um, Georgetown's past in a very public national way mm -hmm. um, and described, in fact, um, this moment for the institution as a moment of atonement, um, of a healing of the relationship between um, Georgetown and surrounding African-American communities in both Maryland, um, DC, and as far away as Louisiana. And I wanna bring that back to our projects because one of the things I've been interested in at MIT as we've launched the MIT and Slavery Project is MIT has a distinct relationship to Cambridge. Um, we have a distinct relationship to the black communities who live right beyond our uh, front gates, our front doors. Um, and this history actually impl is implicated in that relationship. Um, it actually, in symbolic and real ways, uh, 
um, changes the relationship between our universities and African American communities. Um, and where do you see that going? Um, have you actually had experienced that part of the reaction to this work you're doing? Well, from, from the very beginning of our project, I did work with the historian for the local African American community because it seemed like a project, our projects needed to be moving forward in, in tandem. Our, our project did put the lie to an urban myth that many people in our community believed. Many people in our community believed that Princeton students brought their slaves with them to campus. Simply not true. And many people also believed that the African American community in Princeton, which is literally just across the road, because it was, of course, a service community from the university very early on, uh, was made up of the descendants of Princeton slaves. Well, if the Princeton students didn't have slaves, that community isn't descended from them. So that's uh, been mind-blowing, I think, mm -hmm. to, to some of the people there who just understood their community in a particular way. Um, but I think the people, Princeton has had a very large free African American community very early on. And it's a proud community. It's a community that's still there despite a lot of urban renewal and, and relocation. And I think they see the university talking to them now in, in a way that they hadn't been before. The, the public library actually has been key for us in this effort. They sponsored quite a bit of programming, bringing the community and university people together to talk through some of these issues. And it's a safe space and it's a welcoming space in a way that the university itself doesn't always feel to people in town. And you know, you can actually see a version of this that I, I think that's a, you know, a, an important um, extension of the project into the community. The University of Virginia um, has done something similar under their president, under the, the, Univer the UVA and Slavery Project. Um, the President's Commission on UVA and Slavery um, actually uh, began some of their first um, efforts actually in the surrounding black churches mm -hmm. of um, Charlottesville um, and made that as, in fact, a part of the project from the very beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Columbia is a funny situation because Columbia, where Columbia exists today, there was no black community until, you know, back when the university was being founded uh, and during the slavery days. So, and it, it doesn't have a very organic relationship to a local black community the way it seems to have existed in Princeton. It was surrounded by slavery. The site that the King's College building was on was not far from the municipal slave market that way downtown. And you certainly could see slave, the same thing. If you went out the door, there were slaves in the street and hauling things around and all that sort of thing. Um, and then, but, uh, but even more important maybe, the relationship between Columbia, where it now is, and its surrounding community is very fraught with tension and has been for a long time. And many of you may remember, if you're old enough, the events of 1968 at Columbia, which to a considerable extent were sparked by the connections and uh, feelings of exploitation by the local community, the effort to build a gymnasium for the university in a public park, the eviction, the, the process of evicting people from neighboring apartment buildings in order to gentrify, as, or, you know, make the neighborhood safer or more desirable or whatever you want to call it. And um, Columbia and its local community has been, had a very, very tense relationship. It's not a question of slavery, it's, it's now mm -hmm. or recently. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, we have tried to bring in certainly local schools, so to speak, or elite, alert them to what kind of work is being done. But it doesn't have the resonance as of the Princeton situation where you have a black community going way back all the way to the days when slavery was uh, still in existence in New Jersey. I've, I've been making the argument that in fact, part of the resistance to these kinds of histories on campus, and although I, I think mm -hmm. we've passed that now, um, as you said, it, it has very little to do with the past. Right. Right? It actually mm -hmm. has to do with the current politics sure. of American universities, and especially elite well-endowed universities, um, that we're not good neighbors now. Um, is the thing we're trying to hide. It's not so much our history that we're trying to hide. And I, I would agree with Marnie that you know, the, the question of being afraid of our archive is sort of like being afraid of your diary. Right? <laughs> there's, there's nothing in there that's actually going to destroy you. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, one of the things that we, one of the emotional wounds that we don't want to open or we don't want to um, highlight are the emotional wounds that we're creating today. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, the, the fractures that are happening because of campus expansion, um, the role that, in fact, many of our universities play in gentrifying um, our surrounding communities, um, and the, the extraordinary economic and political leverage of those universities, which is just unprecedented um, in these local regions. Well, I, I will say one, one of the things we, we wanted to, to emphasize or, or make very clear with our project is that although slavery ended in 1865, obviously the ramifications and the memory of slavery hasn't ended. So we worked with a filmmaker and I worked with some students who made short videos in which we interviewed Princeton students, alumni, and staff members who live with family stories every day about their family's descent from either slaveholders, slaves, or both. And those videos and films are on the website too. Mm -hmm. Because we, these, these issues don't go away, they're within right. our community too. We don't have to look across the street into town um, to see these issues. The, the people you eat lunch with every day, the people you see in the library talk about these things at their dinner tables. And we wanted to capture some of that for the project as well. I mean, Columbia has a history, I'm sorry to say, of being very, uh, how shall I put it, retrograde in dealing with campus workers, most of whom are minorities of one kind or another. I'm talking about security guards and cafeteria workers and many other people who are working, or even uh, secretaries and others in offices. And that there were long, just as Yale, I, I'm not, I don't know about Princeton really, but you know, long fights about unionization and opposing their right to form unions. And um, that's not slavery, that's as Craig said, that's nowadays, you know, that, that's relations with people uh, right now or at least up to very, very recently. Um, and there, it could, there is a danger, which we must avoid, of, the, of sort of displacing these current issues back onto slavery. Um, it's important to study the history of slavery in our country, God knows, but you know, the condition of our society today is not just because of slavery. It's because of a lot of things that have happened and are still happening. You know, Wells Fargo Bank has, was pushing black people into these subprime mortgages right up to 2008. That's nothing to do with slavery. That's now, and yet it was devastating for black homeowners. Um, so. These problems, are st these practices are still out there in one form or another, and we can't let the emphasis on slavery divert us from saying what is going on right now in American society. And I think there's something really symbolically important in that conversation, um, because one of my reactions to the university's early responses to these historical challenges, and especially from campaigns uh, and protest of student activists around this history, is that universities tend to be, and we may have passed this point on this subject, but we haven't passed it on many others. Universities are extraordinarily frightened um, by any issue that tends to empower black people to make claims upon institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, part of what was frightening about the story of slavery on campus and, and these historical relationships to slavery is that they tended to empower African-American constituencies to make claims upon historically white institutions. And that's what we were running from. Um, now, I, I'm going to wrap, say that because I really wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we're, we're, supposed to <laughs> we're supposed to be in Q&A, but I squeezed that in just before. Um, let's. Um, Let's actually open up to the audience for uh, questions from the audience. And they look depressed and stunned, so we, oh, yes, ma'am, yeah. There's a we microphone, a we'll wait until that comes along, yeah. Uh, hello, Professor Wilder and everyone. I've really been looking forward to being here. And uh, I'm very impressed, Professor Wilder, not only with your amazing book, I, I've mentioned on Facebook several times that it's the best book I ever read in 2016. <laughs> Thank um, you. But also... I wish I brought my mother. <laughs> 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 but also by your work with the Bard Prison Project, which I think is absolutely key. If I were going to say more than I should say because we don't have time about the linkages of the, the past and the present. It would be in the mass incarceration system and the criminal justice system. So I'm wondering how you bring your historical work in this area into 
your work with, with Bard Prison and what kind of responses you get from your students yeah. there. Okay, I'm um, sure in the, in the Bard Prison Initiative, one of the things we do is we end up talking about all of this because we're, you know, because we're teaching history. Um, but I'm always careful to um, draw a distinction with my students between as what um, Professor Foner described as current events and past events um, and more contemporaneous realities and past ones. Um, I, you know, I, I want to be careful about making slavery, um, extending slavery metaphors um, beyond the, their proper bounds. Um, and I think part of the reason that that's attractive to all of us is it creates a kind of moral resonance around issues that we're concerned about. Um, I think there's a danger to it. And the real challenge is to get people to understand mass incarceration with the same, to have the same emotional reaction that they have to mass incarceration as they do with subjects like slavery and other historical injustices. And we have to do the hard work of actually educating the public about um, the horrific consequences of our systems of incarceration in the United States and the systems of, of, uh, that um, criminalize um, low-income um, people um, and increasingly, in fact, um, working-class people. Yeah. Good evening, gentlemen, and I will sing the same praises that the young lady did. My only regret is my 14-year-old couldn't make it. Too much homework, and so my wife and <laughs> that's I That's a good reason. Yeah, that's yeah <laughs> uh, but this is part, and I sent a group email to a lot of friends because I says, to supplement your kids' education, because we've been having this discussion, and some friends behind me here brought their daughter, you know, so it's, it's all part of... Uh, this ongoing discussion that I think our entire country needs to have. And I, I heard your admonishment about the extension of slavery and a set of language and so forth. But at the same time, I think what Georgetown did, what your book spurred, what Professor Horner, Ms. Sandweiss and so forth has been doing is, 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 you know, a discussion that our entire country has been avoiding and things we've been sweeping under the rug, and hence, where we are today that we almost feel as if we're going to have another civil war because so many other people are undereducated and do not know these things and so sometimes it becomes fake news you know conspiracy theories etc um it would be wonderful if maybe ken burns could say hey let's make this project and have you guys you know continue that discussion even further than it is because in the north one of the contentions I've had as someone from the Virgin Islands and Dominique and Guadeloupe and, and knowing all of our histories and the colonial ties and so forth, um, when I come here and I embrace New York and I love it, there's a tendency of course in the schools to have all of the history of slavery that kids go through in elementary school, all of it goes through, this is what happened in the South. Um, and I keep reminding teachers, you know, even here in New York you had your college schools, number one, and all the other discussions that went is the slave markets and all the other stuff going on right around Wall Street and so forth. Um, and so th this, this is such a pertinent discussion, so I'm hoping you guys will find a ways with the websites, with everything else Google can do, and all of your ties to just sort of expand it um, so everyone could feel like we're, we're beginning to get some information from credible individuals um, that brings the history of our country to the point where we could have a, a pertinent uh, discussion of it. Thank you very Thank you. much again. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just say very quickly, I, um, uh, Eric Foner can actually speak to this too. One of the things that's actually happening now is there really is uh, an increasing body of research that's connecting these institutions also to the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, and so we're learning a lot more about, in fact, the Caribbean ties, right down to you know, the individuals, the families, the students. The, um, and it really is a fascinating part of this research is just how active these institutions are um, within the Caribbean largely, and South America for that matter. Right. All right, good. <laughs>
Exactly. And that's part of what's being um, unraveled, that story now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Slavery is being taught. Um, and, uh, you know, I look at textbooks. They're all very good. They're not, it's not like the textbooks we used to have long right. ago. What goes, you know, how, what, how students absorb it. But, well, I'm just telling you what we have... Yeah, let me, how, let me, wait a minute. How many people who said no have been in a classroom lately? I'm not talking about when you were in a classroom. <laughs> I'm, or me. Or me. I'm not talking about when I was learning about this. Well, let me, let me actually let me describe it differently. For, for all of us, you know, I think one of the things that we've all done over the past you know, decades, actually, um, is working with public school teachers. And yes, one of the have. things that I, you know, that one of the places where I learned the relationship between what I do as an academic and what happens in public school classrooms um, are in these sort of teacher training sessions and the professional development sessions that the teachers unions put on um, and they ask us to come to um, and they ask us to do presentations on how to teach this material and how to bring it to students. Um, you know, the, some of our work, some of the current projects we're doing and also the projects on universities got rehearsed um, with public school teachers, high school and um, in particular high school teachers, um, before I published the book. Like one of the first audience, the, among the first audiences I ever talked to the project about were actually New York public school teachers. And so I, the reason I would say that I think it's changed dramatically is my extraordinary respect for the energy and the patience of public school teachers who have gone out of their way to find ways to get this information into their classrooms, who contact us all the time for you know, resources, right. from, from maps to documents, to you know, who read things and, and just send you an email, um, and who show up on their off time, on their days off, for these sort of professional development moments where they don't get paid. Um, they're actually just there because they want kids to have access to this information. Right, and now the Senate is about to pass a tax bill which takes away the $250 right. deduction that students, that teachers can utilize if they put out their own money to provide uh, materials for their classes. This is so to generate more money so to be able to uh, allow corporations to get a slightly larger tax break. So that shows you where we're at. I mean, I agree with Craig. Uh, sure, education can be improved. Uh, no question about it. Um, but I, I'm in incredibly impressed by the teachers I meet all over the place. I lecture all over the damn place, it seems. I have to stop. It's getting too much. But uh, no, I'm even, believe it or not, I just lectured at Auburn High School in Auburn, Alabama. Not everyone in Alabama is Judge Moore, you know? <laughs> I met some really good teachers there who are teaching the Civil War and Reconstruction the same way Charles Sumner would be talking about it in Boston, not like the old, you know, lost cause. So it, it, there is progress being made, I'll just tell you that. Before we get to the next question, I'll just say we're going to do two more. So uh, Stephen will get one, and then I'll get the last. Um, in light of this new information that you've presented today, um, what is your opinion regarding um, removal of statues, removal of memorials for uh, controversial donors? And secondly, um, what is your opinion regarding a more aggressive approach to affirmative action at these schools that have had a, a somewhat jaded past? How many hours do you have here? <laughs> play, play, play not. <laughs> You know, uh, statues, I mean, Mayor de Blasio has a little commission looking at this right now. I, my general feeling is that it's more important to add to the public presentation of history than subtract. I would, but the current public presentation of history everywhere is totally one-sided. I have not counted this up, but, there, you know, how many statues of a black person are there in this country anywhere? You know, we got Frederick Douglass up pretty no, clear where I, near where I live on 110th Street there. Um, you know, there's a, you can, but there's, there are thousands of statues, but you know, the people who put them up were not interested in honoring African-American figures in American history. I would love to, if to, Robert E. Lee, let's put John M. Langston, the first black congressman from Virginia in the 1880s, up right next to Robert E. Lee. They even give him a horse like Lee had. <laughs> Uh, although I don't think he wrote around that much. 
But, you know, that's the problem. You've got a completely one-dimensional right. present. Now, there was, you know, everyone has their own line. There is a line that I would say some people are just over the line, like uh, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, that's let us example. say. You know, there are more statues of Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, founder of the Ku Klux Klan, commander of uh, troops that massacred black soldiers after they surrendered, slave trader before the Civil War. Um, there are a lot more statues of Nathan Bedford Forrest in Tennessee than there are of Andrew Jackson, the greatest president who ever came out of Tennessee. There should not be statues of this guy. He's a homicidal maniac. It'd be like Charles, no, it'd be like a statue of, Char of Charles Manson, you know? <laughs> but that doesn't mean every single Confederate general should be taken down. I think that's, you know, going way too far. I'm more interested in putting up, correct, a, a much more diversified set of monuments and statues of the real history of the United States. What we have is one segment of that history being memorialized now. I, I don't have much to add to that. I, I, would, say, I would say that at, at Princeton, we're engaged in a process right now of diversifying our portrait collection. And portraits are akin to monuments. They, they're in public spaces. The portraits we have don't inaccurately describe who we were. We, we, we right. were a school of white Presbyterian men. That was it. But that is not who we are. And so the school is engaging in a process now soliciting uh, suggestions from the broader university community for people we might add uh, along the lines of Professor They Potter should put your portrait up, Marnie. Uh, <laughs> I'll be happy to get the summer off, <laughs> yeah. <right>. Um, <laughs> So I, I think there are some are symbolic gestures that, that institutions can take. And I'll tell you one that I'm fighting for. As part of this, we're not only adding um, portraits, we're renaming some spaces. And generally, we're not taking names away, but we are naming things that were named west or east or north <laughs> or south. <laughs> right. We, only one of the enslaved people who lived on our campus had a surname. So she's the only person we can trace through history. And her name was Betsy Stockton. She was owned by one of our presidents. She lived on our campus in the president's house, working for his family. She was taught to read and write by him. She was manumitted by him. She became the first single woman to become a missionary in Hawaii. And then she came back and ran a school for colored children in Princeton, New Jersey for 30 years. I want the park on top of our new underground library to be named for her. So. Good luck. Yeah, good, good luck. So it's, it's How much money is she going to donate? <laughs> this, this park is the, 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 the hinge between the town and the gown, and it would be a perfect, a perfect mm -hmm. low-hanging but meaningful gesture. And I just want to draw a quick distinction between the naming controversies on our campuses and the naming controversies in the public sphere generally. Um, in the public sphere generally, I have no nostalgia for um, America's racial monuments, and so I'm not, not going to defend them. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time, actually, on the symbolic struggles to remove them. On campus, I think it's a little bit different, because I think one of the things that our campuses have to deal with is the simple question of how we want to present ourselves as 21st century universities that depend upon an extraordinary um, diversity both nationally and internationally, and where our claims to elite status actually depend heavily upon the presences of people of color on our campuses. And so it's not just, in fact, on campus a question about historic symbolism. It's also about how we choose to present ourselves in the 21st century world, which is why I find some of these conversations so silly. Um, you know, it, the, the Calhoun College one at Yale and the others, you know, um, I don't understand what the great sort of, you know, um, well, let me just say this differently. We actually had no respect for um, building names until white women or people of color complain about them. Right. right. We, we, shave, we, we grind the names off buildings all the time for a donor's check for the, to cover, <laughs> no, to cover the um, renovation cost of it. We, we will grind the founder's name off of a building. The, yeah, only, what, the what, only time that we start waving the banner of tradition is when people of color and white women actually complain about the, um, these institutional problems. Um, and so again, on campus, I think it's a very different conversation because I think we're, we're faced with a different set of questions, which aren't just about the sort of what the public sphere should look like, it's about what private, private and public universities should project um, in the 21st century. Well, and the whole society, what, the, what we should project. I mean, it, it, a lot depends on where these things are. I don't think a person going to a public courthouse should have to confront a big statue of a slave owner there. Maybe 
if someone wants to put a statue of that slave owner in their backyard, that's a different kind of thing. But Knock yourself a, out. <laughs> but as a public statement, this is a courthouse. It should not be, you know, the first thing you see should not be a guy who's a slave owner. Right. So, you know, it, it, yeah. it's, it's complicated. Yeah. But yeah. I agree yeah. with Craig. It's, it's worth discussing because it does stimulate interest in history in mm -hmm. a weird sort of way. But I don't think it's the biggest problem confronting our society right now. Where's our microphone, it's man? It's right there. The okay. last question is okay. coming over there. Thank you. Um, when you began your research, was it the initial shock more of um, that the fact that elite institutions were equally as guilty of having ties to slavery, or was it, or is it the, just the premise that the story of of slavery in itself is just not prevalent in the discussions at these institutions? I would say that I think professional historians have understood for a long time that slavery was prevalent in the North. And since mm. Professor Wilder's book, of course, everybody understands that slavery was prevalent in the early history of these early universities. But it's not enough to say that. You know, um, I think we have a moral imperative to document it. We can't just say all early universities were implicated in this or all early banks or all merchant societies or something like that. We have to have the facts. We have to have the ads. We have to have the wills. We have to have the census records because some people aren't going to like this history and it has to be impeccable history. And I would say that's, that was, that's been a challenge from the very start. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I was I, frankly surprised, not uh, be, not by finding the importance of slavery in the early days of King's College, because Craig had already alerted this to the, us to that, but how little anti-slavery sentiment there seemed to be at Columbia all through the decades going up to the Civil War, jumping after slavery, uh, in the North, that is, after slavery is abolished in New York State, but no real sentiment against slavery seemed to be articulated at Columbia College until the very eve of the Civil War, when the president, Charles King, actually became a pretty outspoken anti-slavery guy. Um, and that surprised me, actually. I kind of felt there must be someone at Columbia who was willing to say something about slavery, but we didn't really have very many of them. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you to our guests.